and realize mixed reality experiences, smart 3D avatars, and create human-machine interaction using the whole body and all our senses. We are Chris and Charlotte, and with our fantastic interdisciplinary research team, we have been developing from artistic experiences to scientific innovations, from augmented reality escape rooms to medical tools up to multi-sensorial dance pieces. Here, you can see our latest research and performance project, KIN, an interactive, immersive, multi-sensorial digital performance for three dancing avatars in augmented space. And the really fantastic thing about this work is that the audience is really, really involved. Through my interaction and movement, I can directly and immediately influence the whole piece myself. So I am really part of the artwork, a participatory art experience at its very, very best. <coughs> the avatar dances react directly, interactively, and in real time to proximity and distance, to speech and wind impulses, and even skin temperature, brain waves, and muscle tension could be very easily integrated using today's sensor technologies. Basically, there are no limits to how I can behave and how the digital dancers react. When I move towards the avatar, and of course, this is especially cool, she changes her behavior, which seems totally realistic, like you're really dancing with someone. If I only had this app when I was in dance school as a teen. Okay, okay, a little embarrassing. We could have recorded that a little less awkwardly. That really sounds tech savvy to me. Well, digital avatars are fascinating, but in addition to the enthusiasm for the possibilities, we also must consider limits and risks. Digitization must adapt to human needs and societal framings, not the other way around. Yes, a little critical distance is always Attention. helpful. We are live oh. in three, two, one, and... In the 80s, digital 3D avatars like Max Headroom were still played by real actors, and the recordings were then digitally manipulated so that it looked like jerky digital humans. If you watch the video clip Paranoia by Art of Noise, you can see how 3D avatars were designed 35 years ago. In the meantime, the production process is completely digital. Artificial intelligence techniques ensure the creation of very realistic avatars with minimal effort. But whenever I see video productions, computer games and 3D animated movies like Polar Express or Love, Death and Robots, the 3D characters are often a bit creepy because although they appear technically realistic, there seems to be something off or missing. That makes cartoon-like films like Soul somehow seem more believable. Yes, this effect almost always occurs when a well-designed avatar lacks the last bit of realism. Experts refer to the phenomenon that an avatar then appears particularly eerie as the uncanny valley effect. Simplified 3D figures are accepted because the abstraction is perceived as deliberately designed. And if the character then becomes much more realistic, but is not 100% perfect, one somehow senses this and is disturbed by it. That's why successful 3D animated films often have a cartoon look. A good story can also be told with unrealistic avatars. Then it is immediately clear to the viewers that the characters are digital and artificial. The question is what it does to the user when you technically manage to interact with a hyper-realistic avatar. If I can't be sure whether my communication partner is real, I can't be sure whether the interaction is trustworthy or fake. Yes, this is a real challenge. With digital avatars in immersive environments like augmented and virtual reality, terms such as interaction, immersion, presence and experience play an important role. User experience encompasses all aspects of impressions and the experience of communicating with 3D virtual characters. Interaction techniques with the avatar can be voice input or gestures or visual interfaces. And with digital technologies such as VR goggles, 
glass or facial recognition, a natural immersion into the world of the avatar is possible. But how much the user feels integrated and present in the avatar's world also depends on non-technical parameters, such as how well the interaction is designed, psychological factors with the user, or the narration of an exciting story. Finally, it also depends on our readiness to believe in it or our so-called suspension of disbelief, as with other types of fictional works. I often also think about what it does to us as humans as we interact more and more with digital avatars. What does it do to my perception of you? What does it do to my perception of my own body? Assuming that increased interaction with digital avatars trains our communication to the point where we perceive the interaction as completely natural, then all that is needed are appropriate tools and technologies to allow these avatars to be developed by anyone. The technologies and instruments already exist. Current game engines like Unreal offer tools to generate realistic avatars from a few photos. And a smartphone can easily recognize and track even the smallest facial expressions. And where accuracy is not sufficiently possible, artificial intelligence methods can be used to generate realistic movements in the shortest time, which were previously only manageable with days of computing. Due to the immersive possibilities of experience, avatars have become more and more interesting for training, educational and therapeutic purposes. We are dealing with the ubiquitous availability of digital technologies. Anyone can produce almost anything digitally. The technology even became strongly connected with our own bodies. Or as the media theorist Marshall McLuhan suggested, technology is an extension of the human body. Such extensions occur when we extend the reach of our embodied mind beyond our natural limited capabilities. As an example, a shovel is seen as an extension of our hands, a bike an extension of our motion capabilities, and a microscope as an extension of our vision. The idea here is, as soon as the interface between human and medium is no longer obvious, the technology would no longer be an extension, but in addition to the human body. So the question is, can avatars be considered an extension of the human body or even its augmentation? This makes us think of cyborgs and the post-human theories that question the nature of human subjectivity and embodiment. At the same time, there's also the post-digital view. Digital tools and forms of representation are now used so naturally that it is no longer an exception but the rule, massively shaping our interactions our gaze and our bodies. One can then ask whether this shift in perception also applies to the analog, because we can assume that digital and analog are no longer separable. Quoting Nicolas Negroponti, the digital revolution is over. Or going in line with Baudrillard's understanding of the final stage of reality representation, we can dwell upon the thought of whether these representations even relate to the real anymore. We live in the world of imitation that became reality in itself, a hyper-reality. In its effects, it is no less real than the tangible world that surrounds us. And this is the point where the ethical questions arise. The enormous potential of avatars has naturally increased the risks involved in their use in recent years. Not only it is feasible to digitally steal other people's identities or to manipulate statements with other people's faces, but also sexual and violent assaults have also become much more realistic, frequent and probable due to the sometimes very plausible immersion. So-called deep fakes describe realistic looking media content that has been largely autonomously and sometimes very credibly altered or falsified by artificial intelligence. Face swapping, voice swapping or body puppetry sometimes have a great destructive potential, which is why there is significant interest in being able to identify deep fakes, restrict their use and make their unauthorized creation a criminal offense. All these considerations are preceded by the ethical question of how a digital avatar can and should be treated. 
Technically, everything is possible. But we have to ask ourselves how we can and want to organize the interaction. Because rules for dealing with smart avatars are still missing in mixed reality. This requires generally applicable ethical guidelines for the society. A good approach is perhaps the golden rule of reciprocity. Treat others as you want to be treated. In mixed reality, it is possible to experience this rule. Also because in virtual reality, one can temporarily, as an in-group member, take on the body of an out-group member. If we assume an avatar to be either an acting counterpart or an extension of the self, in both cases it would be another for whom this rule is applicable. Treat others as you want to be treated. Treat as you want to be, to be treated. This effect here I did by changing the cameras, which makes it seem even more awkward. The distortion I built with an effect filter. Here we used green key, which has the advantage that we can afterwards change backgrounds and set. And here we see the face tracking software Dynamics, a professional program that is used in film and games industry. It captures your facial movements and these are transferred to blend shapes and bones as animation curves. Um, this is an intermediate step that already looks much better. But even here, a lot of manual reworking had to be done. And what is needed now is much more fine tuning. Big issues are eyes and hair, as you can see here as well. The adaption of individual hairstyles is difficult and needs a lot of dedication by a specialized grooming artist. Um, but wait for it. Um, check this out. For this model, I have the different lights in there. That is dome light, key light, rim light and fill light. And then the purpose of the normal map is to fake the light of bumps and dance to enhance the appearance while saving polygons. And as more individual layers, I have direct diffuse which is the first ray from a direct light source and specular direct, which is the reflection on it. Uh, subsurface scattering for how light is interacting with translucent material like skin. And then I have a coat, a light oil filter on the skin, only as the most important things. What's missing now to bring the model to life is a mock-up system for the movement recordings. So for that, we've got OptiTrack here, functioning with passive retroreflective markers in our studio. Um, Charlotte, hold the position, please. Thank you. Hello from Düsseldorf. We are here on the roof of our Merevi lab at the University of Applied Sciences. Dankeschön. 